And I think that's it. So if you'd like to get out your crosswalk notes, you will see that we are in the free to love message series. And we are going to be loving in grace, not in guilt. To try to get your mind around this message series, Freed to Love, I would like you to kind of imagine this in your head. It's an illustration that was given to me years ago. I don't even remember but where it was. But I want you to imagine it's a wedding. So close your eyes. Imagine it's a wedding. And, and the bride is going down the aisle, and she's meeting her groom up front. And as you're watching this, though, you, you realize there's something a little crazy going on. And what you realize is as she's walking down the aisle and as she walks up to her groom, you see that she's pulling a suitcase. She's wearing a backpack. Um, she has her arms full makeup bag and everything she would take on, on a trip. It, it looks like really she's going on a vacation. And she's walking up and... And she gets up there, and her groom also has all of his luggage. And he has also his knapsack. He has a briefcase. He has a number of boxes uh, that he looks like he just received in the mail. Uh, and, and he's holding them, and they're, they're standing there looking at each other. And after they go through the vows, the, the pastor says, you may kiss the bride. And as they come and they try to get close to each other, they can barely touch lips and, and give a kiss because all of the luggage is getting in the way. All of the packages are getting in the way. And now as you look closer, if you look closer at this funny-looking scene while you're thinking, why don't they just put it down? What they're really carrying is baggage. And on every one of the suitcases, if you look closely, there's a word. Wow, that big one she was carrying, it's more like a trunk uh, than anything else. It says guilt on it. He's carrying a briefcase. It says work on it. I think that speaks for itself. But there are things like regret, remorse, past choices. And what it is, it's the baggage, insecurities that they're bringing into the relationship. And what they really need to do is they need to set them down so they can be freed to love. And, and as we look at this, the reality of it is, is that if you look even closer at this, hopefully what you see in this groom or this bride is your face. Because it's not necessarily a marriage relationship, in, although this one happens to be. It's any relationship. Any relationship that you get into, you are bringing your past with you. You are bringing baggage with you. What I found is as you look at putting that, those things down, they're not as easy to put down as you might like to think. We're holding on for dear life. And maybe even with the graphic that we have for our series this one's chained to my wrist. This one's not going anywhere. How do, I, how do I not only put this down, but how do I leave this down? That is what I need you thinking in terms of, of what it means to be freed to love. What are the things, what are the pains, what are the hurts, what are the heartaches that I have brought up to this moment in my life that is keeping me from getting close to the people that I want to get close to the most. And today we are going to, to look at putting one of those downs, uh, putting one of those down, taking the key and, and, and maybe even taking the chain off and leaving it there as we go from guilt to grace, as we love in grace, undeserved love, not guilt. Now, before we even go another step, we, we want to love in grace, not guilt. And it's important to understand those two words because I'm going to be referring to them again and again throughout the message. Loving in grace means that, that I am able to love and I'm able to love because it's a gift. I'm not compelled to do it. I don't have to do it. That it's something that I have a free choice to do as opposed to guilt 
guilt, the best way to think about guilt is when I feel like I am in debt, like I owe someone uh, for, for something that has taken place. So as we look at this, why you don't want to live in guilt, I want you to think about the last time you were guilted into doing something, or at least someone made the effort to do that. My grandma, rest in peace, grandma, was the queen of guilt when it came to us going to visit her. Well, I suppose if you don't have the time with all the times I put in changing your diapers and helping your parents and loving you as a grandma, don't worry about that. And the thing about it, she's serious. She's like legit serious. Like if you don't have the time to give me just a few minutes each day before I die, uh, I'll just die alone. Thanks, Graham. I can hardly wait to get over to your house uh, to talk to you because I know how this conversation is going to go. Or maybe it's something, well, you know, you don't have to help me move this weekend. Even though I was, even though I was there when you moved and remember used my truck and my trailer and you said, anytime, anytime you need my help, you just call and I'll be there. Yeah, you guys know guilt, right? And what happens is the second someone lays that guilt trip on you, all the joy gets sucked out. All of it does. You, you no longer have a choice to help them. You are under an obligation and a debt to do it, and it stinks. That's why as we look at this, why this is so important is because guilt affects and infects every one of us. And not only can we feel guilty, but we try to do it to others as well to get what we want. And in the midst of that, to, to see you are doing yourself and others a disservice by falling in the trap of trying to use it. So where we're going to start in, in one section is 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19. And it's just one verse that shows the attitude of what it means like to live without guilt and in grace. This is what the Apostle Paul wrote. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. And, and what Paul is pointing out, the Apostle Paul is pointing out, is that as a Christian, I am both a Lord, I, I am someone who is free, completely free, subject to no one, and at the same time, I'm a, a servant, I'm a slave subject to all. Why don't you put that in the blank right now? A Christian is a free Lord subject to no one. And a Christian is a dutiful slave subject to all. Now, in that first part where it says a, a Christian is a free Lord subject to no one, you can write next to that if you want, I don't have to. I don't have to. I don't owe you anything. And, and as we look at that, I can say that to you. And here's where it almost gets blasphemous. I can say that to God. And the reason why I can say that to God is because when it comes to guilt and, and what I owe God, Jesus paid it completely. And so as I stand before God, I stand perfectly forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ, and I don't have to do anything. Jesus has done it for me. That's craziness. That's crazy talk. And we're going to get to the crazy talk later uh, to see where this can go south, but, but just bear, me, bear with me for a minute. I don't have to do anything. Dan, are you going to come help me move? I don't have to do anything. <laughs> Dan, do you want to do No, I don't have to. Um, wow, how liberating is that? No guilt, no past, none of it. I don't have to. I'm a free Lord subject to no one. But then the second one is, a Christian is a dutiful slave subject to all. A Christian is a dutiful slave subject to all. Listen to this. This is the eye-opening moment that changed my life after 54 years of not understanding this. So please listen. By the first one, I wrote, I don't have to. By the second one, 
What I had been writing for 54 years was, I do have to. That's not correct. The words that go next to the second one, next to a Christian is a dutiful slave subject to all is, I get to. Write those words down. I get to. And so what happens in the midst of this is because I have been freed by Jesus Christ, because my sins have been forgiven, now as I look at my life, I look at it as an opportunity to show love to God and to others. And I can be like a kid in a candy store choosing how I am going to show thanks for God's love in my life. What I had been doing so many times is that, that I have to. I have to. And it was ruining me. It was ruining my ministry. It was ruining relationships with family. Ruined my relationship with my grandma. Because I let her do it. I let her use that guilt. Now, how do we do this then? How, how do I have this in a practical way? Take this freedom that I have been given through Jesus Christ and this reality that I am also a servant, that that I have been created to love, love God and love others. And how do I practically live this out in my life? That takes us to Galatians chapter 5. And and this is where we're going to be for the rest of the the morning. And that is Galatians 5 verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery it's for freedom it's to be free and enjoy this freedom from sin that i have before god and before others it's for freedom that christ has set me free it's for freedom that christ has set you free So that you are free to live a a loving relationship with God, with him and with others. Not out of obligation, not because you have to, but because you get to. In the blank, you can write, I have been set free from a have-to life and given a get-to life by Jesus. I've been set free from a have-to life And given a get to life by Jesus. Because that has happened, do not let yourself again be burdened by a yoke of slavery. That yoke of slavery, I want you to write the word trapped next to it. I don't want to live a life in which I feel like I am trapped. Ever been in a relationship where you feel like you're trapped? How much do those stink? And and so the question is, let's, I mean, how real do we want to be about this? Ladies, how do we trap men in relationships? What can we do to make it hard, if not impossible, for them to leave us? Maybe if I use some of the God-given attributes of my body, that I can uh, maybe share those with him and he'll want to keep coming back for more. Maybe if I get in a a position where I uh, am doing that and we have a child, maybe if we move in together, then, then he's more likely to stay for a while. You tell me. You tell me, if you've been in a relationship before where you feel like the other person, you're starting to lose them, and you want to reel them back in, and so what you do is you use guilt, you use things where if I do this for them, they will owe me this, and then they won't be able to leave. Oh, guys, quit it. Quit the look you're giving them right now because you do the same thing. That that as you do that, that if you're worried about losing her, maybe if I get her a little farther away from her family, maybe if I get her a little more dependent on me, maybe if I I give her these nice things and, and the security that she wants, she'll stay with me longer. Yeah. Being trapped, using those things trapped. Do you ever feel trapped in a job? 
There's even an expression for this. If you have a great job and you're making good money, they call them golden handcuffs. Golden handcuffs are when you are getting paid so well with with options that are three, four, five years out or, or, or you have the equity that you can't get to unless you stay, you're stuck and you are trapped and being in that job is misery every single day. You with me? Are you, are you understanding? Now, so now what's happening is you're, you're going through your mind and say, how am I feeling trapped? And why am I feeling trapped? And there's a number of different reasons. It might be something that someone is doing to you. But more likely, it's something you're doing to yourself. That there is a guilt. There, there is that payout that you either need to make or you want to have. That is why you are trapped and you are in a yoke of slavery. And when you have the yoke of slavery, the thing about it is you might actually choose to be in that relationship. But because that yoke is there, you'll never know because you feel trapped. You, you might be perfectly happy in that job, but you can't make that choice because you're stuck there. If you do love someone in a relationship, and you've heard this before, you need to let them go. You need to let go of the guilt. You need to let go of whatever they owe you because of the past. And then you are in a situation where you are showing grace. Where you are giving a gift by saying that that payment that is owed to me, I'm going to let it go. Let's start out with no debt whatsoever on the same plane, same playing field, so that we can actually now choose and be free to love. If you think this is true in a relationship with people, it's even more true in your relationship with God. The number one question that I have been asked as I teach the Bible goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, 2 and 3, where Adam and Eve fell into sin. And the question is, why did God create the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? If, if, why did God have to put that tree there? Because by putting it there, if God knows everything, he knows that they were going to fall into sin, blah, 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 blah. And so what you're asking me is, why doesn't God keep us on a chain and every time we get towards the end of the chain, give us a yank back? Because God does not trap you in a relationship. That is not love. That's like asking, how come if you find the the woman that I love, why didn't I just chain her in my house until she learned to love me? Hi, Tanya. (laughs) That might be truer than I like to. Anyways, you, you look at that. Who does that? A psycho does that. They make horror movies about people who do that. And we wonder why God doesn't trap us in a relationship. And the reason why is he wants to do away with guilt. He is going to show you grace. He doesn't pull you in by the chain to love him. He draws you with forgiveness and love and peace. And says, be my child. So why do we even do that? Okay, so you look at this and you say, who wouldn't want a relationship like that? Not a have-to life, a get-to life. Here's the problem. Mark my words. I tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. So now in our relationship with God, that that we look at this, and guilt is kind of a crazy thing. Guilt inside of us. When someone says you're forgiven, when, when God says you are justified, you are declared not guilty of your sin, there's still a problem we have. And that is feelings of guilt. Feelings of wanting to make up for the wrong that I've done. And now, how am I going to do this? How am I going to feel better about myself by doing things that will make, in my mind, God now like me? Maybe I can try to win his love back. 
you might be listening to that and going, actually, that doesn't sound bad. Because if I want to live like I owe God and then I can show him nice things, then, okay, I'll put it to you this way to show how twisted it is. Imagine that my, my child was in a car and she was driving and she got in an accident and was killed. And I find out that the car maker knew that there was an issue with that car with the steering wheel and the brakes. They were fully aware of it. But rather than go through all of the payment that would need to take place to fix the car, they decided to roll the dice and they feel that it would be actually cheaper for them to do a payout of an accident than it would for them to do a factory recall. Just a business decision. Now I want you to go through the process, and I pray that none of you have had to, maybe, maybe you have, of them putting a dollar amount on your child's life. You tell me when the payment's going to be enough. You tell me when you're going to get to a point and say, okay, now I'm good with it. Now I'm good with what you've done. It's insulting. You can, you can put that on there, but it will never be enough payment. You can start. You can try. But the only way that you can get past something like that is not through the payment or they're never going to satisfy you. Ultimately, the only answer is grace. Forgiveness. Even on a calculating cold heart that would take your child's life and try to put it in monetary numbers. That is the only way past. You see, next to guilt, the flip side of that coin is self-righteousness. And so what happens is when I feel guilty and I try to do good things that make up for the bad things that I done at, I've done, at some point I feel like I get even. And then at some points... I feel like I even get ahead. And so in that relationship that I'm in, I no longer feel guilty. I feel superior. Now I'm in a position where, oh, I've been waiting for this for years. They owe me. Now the tables have turned. Now I'm in the driver's seat. Now I get to to guide these discussions and where we go. And God says, don't even try in your relationship with me. Your your attempts at self-righteousness are not only embarrassing for you, but they they make God sick. As as he thinks about the arrogance of us thinking we can pay our way out of the death that we cause for Christ because of sin. In the blank, you can write, a performance-driven life. A performance-driven life negates the work of Jesus. It negates the work of Jesus, that I don't need grace anymore. It obligates me to keeping the whole law that God says, you know what, if you're going to try that, you have to be perfect. And and the very fact that you have guilt in the first place shows that you're not. And it leaves no room for grace. Once again, verse 4, where it says, you who are justified... Who are trying to be justified by the, law, uh, by the law have alienated yourself from Christ. There is no working your way through guilt with God by the things that you do. Only grace. He goes on, verse 5. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. A way to be right with God. And we look forward, we hope to it for the day that we'll be with him in heaven. For in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision it doesn't make any difference what you do. It doesn't make any difference if you're trying to do this or trying to do that. It doesn't make any difference. And why? Because you are free through Christ. Circumcision or uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. I am now free to love. In the blank, you can write, I am free to love when I abandon my performance. I am free to love when I abandon my performance and focus on 
Jesus' payment. I am free to love when I abandon my performance and focus on Jesus' payment. Pastor Jeff and I have been working together for eight years, and, and other members of the staff, but Jeff and I have gotten very close, very close personal relationships. And uh, one of the things that he has pointed out to me probably many more times than he should have needed to, I'm just going to tell you, I am one of the worst guilt-ridden people in the world. That, that guilt ruins my ministry, guilt ruins my relationships, and guilt makes a thing that I would love and choose to do every day of my life feel like, like something I want to run away from as far as I can. And the reason why that as we make this turn, here's the deal of what I found is in the church, people try to make me feel guilty all the time. And, and they do it in, in ways where they, they kind of equate me with God, which I'm sure you, no, okay. The, I'm not, I, maybe that's the problem, Dan, uh, is they equate God being there all the time and filling their every need with me doing it. Or, Believing that I, I should do whatever it is they want me to do. And I could, it, you know what? It would probably be therapy for me to go through my emails and just read through them with you as a church. To, to just watch the, the attempt of using guilt to try to get me to act. And I'm just going to tell you, it works. It really does. That there are times when I, it just like, oh man, that I've... I've I don't know what it is. There's something about guilt that makes me feel better than if I do something to try to placate them or make them happy. I'm telling you, if this will destroy me and my ministry, period, and you. And this is where I've landed, is this. I am not a victim here. I'm not. When it comes to people trying to make me feel guilty, I can say it in those terms like it's something people are doing to me, but there's only one reason why that works, and that is because I let it work. That, that it makes me feel better about myself in some strange way, and then it takes me to that other part where, Dan, once you start to do that, you're obligated to the whole law. You've gone away from grace in your ministry, and now a workspace ministry, so people will like you by what you do and say you're better than another pastor. It's like, oh my gosh, what is wrong with you? And the answer, though, is in these verses. So, in, and in these verses, and also in this fill-in, I am free to love when I abandon my performance and focus on Jesus' payment. I'm telling you, that is the only way out. If you feel like people are trying to use guilt on you and, and that it's working, you have got to take ownership and, and understand that's your problem. And the way to be free to love them is to go back again and again every day, multiple times throughout the day, and say, I'm free, and I'm subject to no one. I don't have to. And I'm a slave, dutiful to all. I get to. And, and God directs me on how I get to do this in my life. This is huge. This is something I want so badly for you in all the relationships you have because I see people who are miserable and the only, the biggest reason why they're miserable is because they feel trapped. And there is tons of guilt and very little, if any, grace. And so the grace comes from outside of you through the cross of Jesus Christ. It starts in your relationship with God that he says, we're good. You are forgiven. You are loved. And, and going back again and again and again and taking that relationship with you into your life. Paul had to address another issue, though, too. 
And that was at the beginning when I said, I don't have to. Yeah. He's like, be careful with that. Be careful with that. And this is what he said. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to start with the end of that where it says, if you want to live a self-righteous life, which is the flip side of guilt, you know where that ends up? You bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. That's what I was describing before of being in a a guilt-laden person. You get bit and devoured and destroyed. You, you will tear each other apart. That's what self-righteous people do. Because they look at how good they are and how bad other people are. And they just pick and peck and bite. And it's like, enough. So, so what he does, though, say is, you were called to be free. Let's fill in the blank, and then I'll I'll try to explain it. Freedom is not getting to do whatever I want. Freedom is not getting to do whatever I want. Freedom is doing what God has made me to do. It's not getting to do what I want. It's getting what God made me to do. And so an example that I heard that I think is a really good one is, if you want to free a fish... You would take the fish, maybe it's in a a tank or whatever it is, and you would put it into the ocean, and now that fish can swim. That's that's freedom for the fish. It gets to go and, and be a fish. But if that fish decides that it wants to go on land, it will die. And the reason why is when you free it, when you 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 let it do what it was created to do. That when it decides it doesn't want to do that anymore and it wants to go a different route, doing what it's not meant to do will kill it. And somewhere in Western thinking, that we have gotten to think that freedom in Christ means I get to do whatever it is I want to do, whether it's harmful for me or not. The, 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 the idea of that, if it makes me feel good in the moment, it must be good for me and it must be healthy for me. And God says, no, 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 no. That I understand the human mind always goes there, but it's saying, Lord, what would you have me do? And his answer is, with the grace that you've been shown, show grace in your lives. With the forgiveness that you've been given from me, Don't hold people hostage in your relationships because of what they've done to you. Have grace-filled relationship where you serve one another in love. Freedom is not getting to do whatever I want. Freedom is doing what God has made me to do. And so finally, he says, So I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. And the spirit is what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that you do not. So that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit. You are not under the law. No longer under the law. I'm led by the spirit. And now the spirit is going to lead me. To act in my life. When we were going through this in our message prep, one of the quotes that uh, one of the individuals said to me that really has resonated is when you go from guilt to grace, when you love in grace and not guilt, your to do list is probably going to be very similar. But your attitude with which you do it is going to change. And so I want you to think about this as as you are leaving here today. That there's a very good possibility that what you are going to need to do today is going to be very similar. That they are things that that would be um, maybe in the past you had been guilted into doing. But now the guilt is gone. Now it gives me this opportunity to live in love, and that love is such a a great motivator. One more illustration I'll give that I hope it helps. 
And that is, uh, it, my, it makes me think of my brother. We were pheasant hunting earlier this year. And when we go pheasant hunting, we usually walk 12 to 15 miles a day through grass that's about waist high, through marshes, through cornfield, through soybeans. And by the end of the day, I'm just going to tell you, we are tired. And I remember him saying one day, if I had to work this hard at work, I would quit. But I can't wait to get out here to do this. I love this. And that's the attitude with which God wants us to show love. That, that, if, that if love was a job, it would be so hard that we would quit. And that's what guilt makes us feel like. It makes us feel like I've had enough. That I'm drawing the line here. I've paid my debt. I don't owe anyone anything else. But living in grace makes us look around and say, man, there's so many opportunities to have fun, showing joy, showing my love to God by showing it to others. Lord, give me the strength to do this today. In the blank, you can write, gratifying my desires also makes me a slave to evil, and I don't want to do that. But rather, following the Spirit gives me freedom. And that is what you have, freedom to love and freedom to do good. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity you have given us in our lives. You've taken away guilt. We don't owe you. We don't owe anyone else anything. And the reason why is because our debt was paid through Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, on a daily basis, let us go back to Jesus. Let us go to him with all of our guilt Uh, with all of our guilty feelings, with all of our past, with all of the luggage, with all of the baggage that we bring into our relationship with you and our relationship with others. Lord, the cross of Jesus Christ and his empty tomb are the key that unlocks those shackles from our lives and gives us this newfound freedom and motivation to live for you. Now, Lord, as we go from here today, help us to have that attitude every day of our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.